And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Mythic Space, and also the creator of Twilight Kingdoms, which are both on his ish.io page. The one and only Peter LeClara. How are you doing today, man? I'm good. It's LeClara, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. Yeah, I don't, I Nobody don't... has ever pronounced my name right the first time, but... I try my know. best to, d to do so, but I have my slip-ups. Fair enough. So... I suppose the I suppose where I'll start is where I usually start on these kind of things, and that is the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Um, the the first role-playing game uh, I ever played was the Rule Cyclopedia D and D that my friend got out of the library. Uh, when I was like 10 years old. And I'd been playing Hero Quest, and Magic the Gathering had just come out, and I was deep, deep in that realm. And it's like suddenly discovering Dungeons and Dragons was just like, oh, this is the thing I always wanted all this other stuff to be. And then it's probably, you know, I've been doing it for. Almost 30 years now, and uh, it is the only thing that I've consistently done for 30 years, so at this point I think I'm pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be fair of me to say that even before you got the rule cyclopedia, you were already um, house ruling bo board games that you had? Yes. Uh, if I, you go back, uh, it's lost in one of the many moves at some point, but... You know, you go back and look at that old Hero Quest like rules book. You'll you'll see all these penciled notes in there that I put in, and you know, I I made my own version of like a a haunted house game that you know for a school project that you know was me trying to make a dungeon before I knew what dungeons were. Mm -hmm. And. Were, did would you consider yourself more of? I would. I was going to ask if you consider yourself a what a one system guy, but given some of the inspirations that you've listed for Mythic Space, oh, that's obviously not the case. No, I've played. I'm not going to say almost everything because there's that's way impossible. too much. But I've been, I've been all over the spectrum. You know, like. Yeah, I played classic Deadlands. I played Noblis. I've played Rollmaster way back in the day. Um, it's it's you know Unisystem games, Savage Worlds. Uh, I've classic Shadowrun with Fistful of Dice. We were just talking about a lot of White Wolf. You know, I've been all over the place. Yeah, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. Um, if you I basically brought... <laughs> grew up on RPG.net, yeah. uh, so I got exposed to a lot of stuff at a pretty young age. So you probably you probably suffered through that, that uh, the longest review ever when Sartan and McLennan decided to review the worst RPG ever. I have read the full Fatal review. Yes. Oh. As. And there's there's there there was one of similar length when it came to Senzar, which is the one of one of the unholy RPGs that gets talked about less. Yeah. Um. And to be and to be fair between between all of the bad RPGs, it's the one that's the least offensive because it could be best described as somebody playing A D and D on a cocaine binge. Yeah, there's still some real questionable stuff in there, but. Oh, there, there is. Like, like I said, AD and D on a cocaine binge. Yeah, sure. Uh, nah. 
not to be confused with not to be confused with AD not to be confused with AD and D while you're free while you're free basing or or hanging out with Hunter S. Thompson. That honor goes to World of Cinnabar. Mm -hmm. But when it comes now, when it comes to when, previous before this, you had done you had done as I mentioned before, um, Twilight Kingdoms. Yes. Um. Talk to me about the about the story bet between you house ruling to full to deciding, screw it, I'm just going to make my own thing. So, um, I was one of like the dozen or so people who were really really sad when fourth edition D and D went away. Um, and I had been house ruling. Uh, 3.5 to be closer to 4e before 4e even came out. Um, you know, I, I had a whole hack of uh, the Star Wars Saga edition, um, mm -hmm. and I basically hacked Final Fantasy into it, like all, all the Final Fantasy tactics stuff. So, um, using that rule set, which if you really think about it, like I basically you know, what was getting halfway to 4E before 4E. I think, 4E I, ha I, think I have that version. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, Final... F yeah, I have a folder called Final Fantasy Saga Edition, parentheses, Peter LeClara. That's me. <laughs> I, I, that's me or from, Peter like, LeClara. 15 years ago or whatever when, uh, when Saga Edition came out. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I did that, and then you know, I love fourth edition, mm -hmm. but I... it is it, it has its faults, mm -hmm. especially once you uh, get past like single digit levels, and every fight is like two hours long. Um, so I'd had all these ideas kind of like kicking around in my head, and we'd been playing a fifth edition game for like a year and a half, two years at that point. And then the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden nobody could see each other anymore, and I had a whole bunch of free time on my hand. And it's just like, fine, I'm just going to take this time, and I'm going to actually build this game that I've had sitting around in my head for, like, the last six, seven years, or however long it was. Mm-hmm. And, um... For what it's yeah. worth, the um, fourth edition is nicknamed around here the edition I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because I did because they didn't keep up on the payments or the check bounced. Uh. But I'm guess I'm guessing the experience you had with doing Final Fantasy Saga Edition led to um, le eventually led to the creation of Twilight Kingdoms. Yeah. So, I mean, I borrowed a bunch of ideas from that. Um, and then I hacked a whole bunch of stuff together from 4E. And really what it grew out of was my frustrations with Pathfinder 2, which we'd switched over to from 5th edition. Um, and I was like, this is cool, but it's running into... It didn't learn its lessons from 4th edition. And the handling time at the table after a certain point just got too cumbersome. And it's like, I want this deep, intricate tactical game, but without, like, the insane numbers bloat and handling time. And the goal was to just, like, take that, borrow as many ideas from, like, skirmish war games and tactical games as I could, and just, like, build it into... Um, in, you know, an RPG where I got that sense of interesting character building and interesting tactics that didn't also make me want to blow my head off after an hour and a half of combat. Mm -hmm. Now, with was it just a natural case of you had done you had done fantasy, then you wanted to do SF, or were the or were there some other? Um, steps involved from the from the transition from 
Twilight Kingdoms to Mythic Space. Sure. I mean... Um... I think I followed the uh, the reverse path uh, that Kevin Crawford took, um, where it's it's like he started with a science fiction game and then poured it over to fantasy, and I started with a fantasy game and poured it over a lot of the ideas to science fiction because they're both very very close to my heart. You know, Halo Combat Evolved is my favorite game of all time. Um, you know, I've always been a big like Star Trek fan. Star Wars was closest thing I had to a religion for a while um, and it's it's it just sort of came naturally um, to take the ideas that I had sort of um, already started to explore in Twilight Kingdoms mm -hmm. and then move that over to a science fiction setting plus I felt that the type of games that I like like, you know, you can get pretty close to the type of games that I like in a fantasy setting. You know, like Pathfinder does exist. You know, you've got Shadow of the Demon Lord. Mm -hmm. You've got all sorts of stuff in that space where it's like these interesting character building games where you can have like the these cool tactical experiences. Um, and it felt like the games in the sci-fi arena were a good five to ten years behind those games uh, in the fantasy realm, probably because 5th edition has sucked all of the attention, you know, development attention away from that, from, and just sort of focus it on fantasy. Um, and it was like, you know, you'll go on Reddit, and you will see people ask for recommendations for a science fiction game. And you will get the exact same recommendations every time, which will be like, look at something like Mothership. I mean, Mothership is very cool, but it's very OSR, and it's very focused on horror. Um, you know, you've got Stars Without Number. Stars Without Number is... Like, the, the, the world building and, and the GM tools in Stars Without Number are phenomenal but it, it's like the um the, the actual like combat and tactics aren't significantly more evolved than what i played with in the rule cyclopedia you know back when i was a kid um and you'll see people recommend scum and villainy and you know i love fortune and dark stuff but when i you know nobody's gonna bust out the miniatures when playing blades um and I like my big pew pew sci-fi battles, uh, as as I've mentioned. You know, I want, you know, to have that chunky XCOM feel where people are like getting into cover, and you're all worried about sight lines and Overwatch and all that stuff, and things are exploding all around you. Um, and if I was in, if I was in that conversation, that. if I was in that conversation, one of the ones that I'd probably bring up with people is um, Fragged Empire. But I will admit I have my own biases because its creator has been on has been in this temple in the past. <laughs> sure. And like I liked Fragged Empire, but it's still not quite there, you know. As far as far as what you were specifically looking for, but yes, I do think you end up highlighting something, and that is a lot of people. And I do I do partially blame the. D and D can run any kind of fantasy nar narrative that I've had to put up with for twenty years. Is there is this there is this mindset of of using a of treating treating a specific genre or a game within a genre as a one size fits all affair. Mm -hmm. And no game is no game is going to be is going to be made for everyone. It's the reason when I do reviews I don't do um, a score system. It's more about sure. who would I recommend this to. Um, as much as I like, say, um, mutants and masterminds, it does come with its caveats of the of the fact that once it, that when you venture off the beaten path, you're get your the risk of traps is go, is going to happen, and it's not and um it's going to be trickier if you want to do 
um, street level campaigns, which given the popularity of the of Marvel Netflix was something that got brought up with me on more on more than one occasion. Mm-hmm. Um, for something like for something like Mothership, I'd say I'd I'd recommend if you're if you're a fan of the of those of the sci-fi horror boom of the 70s and 80s, you'll fit right in with you'll fit in right I in mean, with Mothership. I uh, sure am, but like that's not my primary uh yeah. And even even th- and even that has it has its own asterisks. Um mm-hmm. When it com- when it comes to if somebody was if somebody if somebody was a gi- was coming into this as a giant fucking weeb, I'm not gonna sit. I'm not gonna have them sit in front of D and D. Right. Um. I'd pr- I'd probably I'd probably put them in front of a game that le- that it would be fan would be fantasy, but lean into that aesthetic. But truth be told, yeah, like I'd Hannah ask- Fabio Ultima. Um, Fabula Ultima is is one is one example, um, but in but one thing that I've no, one thing that I've noticed, and you've probably seen this as well, there's been a severing away from doing the quote unquote anime RPG and more about focusing on on a specific anime or a or a subgenre and building around that. Sure, it's because you know back in the '90s when you know I was playing Big Eye Small Mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we only had like a handful of imports, um, and so everybody had like some idea of what anime was. And now, you know, it's decades later, and you know, people can just sit there with a Crunchyroll subscription, and it's like, you know, you realize anime is a, a, a medium; it's not a genre. You have it's no idea how pi- how pissed off I would get when pe- when people would refer to animation as a genre. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. And these, in that in that particular vein, if some if somebody wanted a quote unquote anime RPG, I'd ask them, okay, what okay, what anime have you been watching lately? And then sure. and then kind of narrow it down from that because. To be fair, they they're like saying anime as like a shorthand for like Shonen Jump type stuff. Like you can you can kind of uh, get like I've already got I've already know. got that covered with Shonen Final Burst. Well, sure. <laughs> Which that which um, and that one that one would have an even lower barrier of entry because everybody's got a playing card deck somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and if if you don't have one, you can get them for like a dollar. <laughs> Why and, do you and, think I use them as a mechanic in the game? <laughs> and I shouldn't I should note that I do that, and you probably came to this as well. Card playing cards or just cards in general is. And un- is untapped potential when it comes to game design. Whenever I bring this up, someone inevitably br- brings up Savage Worlds. That does not count. The only yeah. time it uses cards is initiative. Same reason I don't count Dragon Bane. Well, I mean, if you're a huckster in Deadlands, you still use the poker deck. But that's yeah, I know that's a mean. stretch. <laughs> sure. I I could I could feel I could feel you contorting yourself into it into a knot for that one. <laughs> Well, sure. Yeah, but I played classic Deadlands, which had a lot more to do with the cards. Mm-hmm. But when when I, the template that I use whenever whenever it comes to a card based RPG in that sense is stuff like Dragonlance Fifth Age. I never played that one. Which the deck is the o- it has its it has its own fi- it has its own fate deck, but that's the only thing that you use, mm-hmm. and. Of co- there was also a Marvel Super Heroes Adventure game, which had its which had its own deck, but it's one that is e- a little bit more easily adaptable because you don't have as many suits. But well, there was um that Gamma World that came out around the time that Fourth Edition D and D did, and that was all card based, or not all card based, but like all of your character building was done by just like drawing like random mutations from a deck. Yeah, that one was a little bit. It- I'm not sure if I'd go with with that one as an example because when it comes to actually playing you're still using dice. Sure. Uh, but there's a handful of um IPs that you mentioned it being a being a love being a love letter to and I'd like to I'd like to go through a few of them and just see what you drew from that what you drew from it and adapted into 
uh, mythic space. Sure. So, I'll start with I'll start with the obvious with with Halo. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know you've spoken um, about your love for Combat Evolved. Yeah. No. I. Uh, I mean, I love basically everything Bungie has ever done. Um. You know, e even. Uh, like so, myth, the fallen lords, and all I, that. I was just about to. I was just about um, to bring up and, that and, um, and Oni. Oni. Yeah. No, I played Oni. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. So, um, you know that that core gameplay loop in, in Halo, where you're just kind of always being forced to make a choice and use the tools uh, at your disposal, and you basically always have to solve this really interesting combat puzzle kind of in the blink of an eye mm -hmm. um where you know th and there's a lot of things that contribute to that so in, in my game uh you have regenerating shields you know you've you've got grenades and um it all kind of like flows together and there's an emphasis on cover which there's a big but there's also an emphasis on like running and doing some like crazy stunts mm -hmm. And that sort of thing, which are built into the system. And all of that is, you know, like you definitely, I've had plenty of playtest fights where you could easily put Rock Anthem for saving the world on in the background and it wouldn't be out of place. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing, have to... I was curious if you, if you were, if at some point you tried to import your own version of the Golden Triangle. Um, sort of. Um, that is harder to do in a tabletop setting, um, but there, there's, you know, you've got your primary weapon, you've got your gear, and then the, the main thing is that it's more um, focused on exploiting status effects, mm -hmm. which is... Um, I, I played a lot of... Darkest Dungeon 2, since it's been in early access, and that was actually a massive inspiration on me, um, just with the way the tokens work in that. Mm -hmm. And, like, that that's a whole thing that, um... I, I found that I could uh, emulate Mass Effect's power combos um, with that sort of thing, and get a lot of that same feeling. Yeah. So in that way, that that's the uh, other, you know, main game that it's, um... So that that it's sort of drawing inspiration from so that that borrowing that token mechanic gives you that same feeling of setting up and executing combos just in a turn based setting. Mm -hmm. And since you brought since you brought up Mass Effect, I'm I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that we're talk that we're specifically talking about the combat loop that you that we saw in two in two and three and not yes. not as much that that the one that we saw in one. Yeah, I mean, I love the world building in one, but I think basically everyone will agree that the combat is kind of janky in that. It, it it is, and there's and there are certain classes that it, that end up own zoning everything else. Yeah, which was an issue that would that would not be fixed with subsequent games and three I've described three I've described three's um combat heights as a happy accident especially on PC on console it played re it played relatively standard but because of because of some really subtle changes involve involving movement combat ends up feeling a lot more faster and a lot more rewarding of aggression hmm uh oh. I, and, I only ever played it on on console, so. And um, because because of the fact that everything out that everything else, um, doesn't fo doesn't foster that aggression, I feel like it was something that happened on accident. Well, I played a lot of the Mass Effect Three multiplayer, which mm -hmm. I think is one of the best horde modes ever made. Um, and that was a, a big inspiration, uh, on the game as well. And you know, so. There's certain levels where, uh, you know, aggression is rewarded, but uh, once you start getting to the higher difficulties, you sort of have to be a lot more careful. Yeah. And 
the the one the one co the one um combat style that's that's been my whipping boy when it comes to Mass Effect is Andromeda because it presented a really cool idea that it did that um that it co that it completely screwed it it completely got in its own way about completely oh, screwed you've it over. Described all of Mass Effect Andromeda. <laughs> yep, yeah, but I'm specifically referring to the concept of favorites. Mm -hmm. Putting aside the fact that the class system is a blatant rip of the class system that was the class setup that was in um, Kingdoms of Amalur. Oh, uh, I mean, you, well. ha you have the you have the tr you have the Trinity you have the Trinity and you have the Universalist. It's um. You're allowed to steal mechanics. Yeah, mecha yeah, you you are. It's just it's just playing one then playing the playing the other. I could I it's something I couldn't unsee. Sure. Oh. Character building was not the problem in Andromeda. It was basically everything else. Well, the funny the funny thing is there was a poll that was that, that was done where what on whether or not they either go to the the next game either focuses on a whole new galaxy or went into the first contact war. In mm -hmm. hindsight, I think I think the I think um, I think a first contact war um, game might have been might have been more interesting. You know what? One. That... I'm not sure that I agree. I get tired of prequels. Um. You know, I, I'd much rather stories try to show me something new. Um. I, I will put I will put one caveat on it though. Yeah. In um. Instead of going, instead of going the pow the power trip RPG that the trilogy did, if if someone asked me how I'd hand how I'd handle a first contact war approach, I'd say, um, look at ODST, build off of that. Yeah. Well. Well, build off of what it was supposed to be. Where you were so yeah. You know, where you're supposed to be up. Where you're supposed to be up against the wall and at and at a significant disadvantage. Oh, it's just that because of the fact that's that somebody at the somebody in the higher ups thought that recon had the same length as other games. Read Modern Warfare. That it that it could just be a just be a standalone. Oh, but, I mean, I think ODST stands pretty firmly on its own as a game. But that's just me. Yeah. But I'm I'm more referring to the fact that in ODST you do, you you didn't ha you were a lot more, you were a lot more squishy and the unlike the ba unlike the battle rifle the silenced SMG that you have that you have is more is more reliant on you having to be precise. Yeah, and that's ca if you're if you're doing that sort of if you're doing. The idea of you're playing as an N7 in the first contact war—that's the approach I'm t I'd take. The you're up against an enemy that has a technological edge, so you have to be doubling down on skill. You know, throw throw some stealth in there. Why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? But one of the, now one of the other things I I saw that was met on the um, play test that was mentioned as an inspiration, oddly enough, was Thirteenth Age. Yes, which I will I will stand Thirteenth Age any day of the week. I mean, yeah, Thirteenth Age is great, but mm -hmm. it does have some of the uh, complaints I have with Fourth Edition with the numbers bloat. But it's got a lot of really great ideas in it, some of which I have proceeded to rip off, like the backgrounds. I think backgrounds are brilliant. I've something so that I've... I just. Something that I said them. in the past, um, when the background thing came up, is one of the hard to swallow pills is that D is that D and D does not do well with skill systems because it was yeah. never designed with them in mind. It was right. something that, and whenever I bring this up, people will bring up the thief skills in pre, in pre three E D and D, which were bolted on afterwards because the thief was an add on class. That that and. That's a class feature for a specific class. Yep. Putting aside the fact that it's that it's using percentile when everything else isn't, 
also an also annoys the hell out of me. I like a little bit of universality with how um with how th with how things work. But yeah, um I had a version of the game that had a set skill system in it and it didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Um and then I had had um a system before that where you got to make up your own skills, but they all had to just be like a verb. Um, and that also had some weirdness to it. And I was like, man, I'm sitting here trying to reinvent backgrounds. Why don't I just use backgrounds? They're way better. Mm -hmm. But something that one thing that I find interesting is the use of aspects and tactics. Yes. Uh, what pro what prompted that? What prompted this whole choose choose two of each approach that you have with that? Um. So my other favorite game of all time, after Halo, is Final Fantasy Tactics. Mm -hmm. And Final Fantasy Tactics is you know you basically pick two classes and you smush them together. Um, and I if you look at how Twilight Kingdoms is set up, I have that uh, same idea for uh, the combat skills um, where you, you pick two talents in it. And when I was developing Mythic Space, one of the things I looked at a lot was, you know, Lancer. I was very inspired by Lancer. Mm -hmm. um, and Lancer notoriously does not give a flying fuck about non-combat stuff um i mean it, it sort of does but like that is not why you are playing that game you are playing that game to build your cool mechs and blow stuff up with them mm -hmm. um but you know i like to have a good mix in there and i wanted to have that same sort of interesting character building uh bit where you got like cool abilities and you got to be like haha look at this crazy thing that i can do but in a non-combat setting um and so i wanted to make sure i had um what i wanted was i wanted to silo off the combat and the non-combat abilities but i wanted to make sure that the non-combat stuff was as interesting and as tailored and as evocative as the combat stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to combat, one of the things I do one of the things I do find very interesting is the is the way you handle um, damage with it be, with it being divided um, divided into three types. Mm-hmm. Or, and in that in that same vein, you've got shields and you have armor. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. I'm curious. What, I'm curious what the what the um, dividing line between the two is in the way you in the way you design it. Well, I knew I wanted to have regenerating shields. Um. But I didn't want people just going back up to full health constantly. And I wanted to have, you know, some of that logistical problem where, you know, sometimes you'll get through a real tough firefight in, in Halo and you'll have that, like, one, like, red pip of health left. And you've got all your shields, but you have to be real careful for a while while you scrounge around for a med pack. Mm -hmm. Um, and I sort of wanted to try to capture that feeling as well. And also, you know, if you start taking armor damage in a fight, there is no way to repair armor damage while you're in combat. So you will chew through somebody's shields and, uh, you'll start chipping away at their armor and their shields might recharge, but that fight will eventually draw itself to a close. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. because uh, you know the, your maximum hit point total basically is getting lower as time goes on. Oh yeah, and I can also see what you what you intended when you meant when you mentioned um, status effects were a big deal, and I'm guessing that was some that was something that was loosely inspired by both Mass Effect and Darkest Dungeon. Yes, I kind of took both of those ideas and put them together. Um, Because the other game that I really love is XCOM, and XCOM is very uh, influential in how um, movement and cover works. But I I wanted to get like that that setup and payoff combo, which is not because XCOM largely. the, the the dominant strategy in XCOM is to alpha strike things, and I didn't want to just have every fight devolve into who can focus down uh, the other side first. Um, I wanted to have like a bit of like a setup and payoff there. Mm-hmm. Now, when it come when it comes to it when it comes to advancement, you're go you're it's clear to me that you're going with a freeform XP approach. Uh. Um, yes. One of the things I want... There, there, there's a few different um, advancement tracks in the game. By and large, uh, your capabilities get wider instead of taller. You can do more stuff, but the numbers stay relatively flat. Um, they will slowly go up over time, but like, you know, my, my playtesters and I have been playing for, you know, uh, uh, over a year at this point, and they've had like two or three attribute increases. Um, and some of that is because uh, I've done a lot of like retooling uh, of the rules and they've rebuilt their characters from scratch, but even still... Uh, your attributes increase relatively slowly, and the big number increases come from your ship upgrades, which are pretty expensive and things that the whole group works towards. Mm -hmm. Now, not too long ago, I covered um, Coriolis, which is an interesting Mm -hmm. mix of science fiction meets Lawrence of Arabia, as, as as I referred to it. And when it came to the sh- when it came to the way ships wor- ships worked and especially ship combat, the approach that it took the approach that it took was treating each of each of the party members as taking a crew position. With ships in mythic space, do you have a similar kind of approach of di- of different crew positions, or do you have something else? Well, I have yet to encounter an RPG that I felt did space combat in a really satisfying way because the stakes in space combat are it's this thing where like you know if one player dies in a normal combat you know that character is dead but if your ship gets blown up in a space combat you've just tpk'd the entire party Um, And there are things you can do to mitigate that. But one of the things I did was I said, you can, you you have these rules here that if you want to run an action scene using the ship, you can. But I explicitly call out, you can't blow up the player's ship. You can just basically make their lives miserable with it. Um, you know, you can blow up their stuff, you can damage their equipment, but you can't, uh, you, you cannot destroy the crew's ship because, you know, you're not supposed to blow up the Enterprise every movie, Paramount. No, you're just supposed to crash it because you let, because you let Counselor Troy drive. Yeah. (laughs) Dear God, Generations was stupid. Well, yeah, but well, I well then then again, I have made the joke that if if Cis, if Cisco was in first contact, the movie would have been five minutes long. Very much, yes. 
Most, mostly, beca- mostly because Cisco would have shortcut a lot of next generation plots. <laughs> yeah, some of some of, and some of it involving punching because, well, Q. Well, the joke I I often use is Q showed up on the Enterprise and how hou- and hounded Picard for years. Q showed yeah. up on DS Nine once, got punched in the face, and never showed up again. Yeah. <laughs> But something that I did, something that I did realize when I look at the way you handle the action role and difficulty, is in a roundabout way, it is somewhat reminiscent of the action control table, which is the right. sy- which is the system that was used in Marvel Phase Rip, um, more recently in stuff like Ascendant. It kind it kind of got di- it kind of got dipped into in Bash. You are naming a bunch of games I haven't played. Interesting. But the the reason why the reason why I say that is you have the you have the degrees of success or failure based on the based on the D twenty, and mm-hmm. the the um the threshold for those successes varies depending on the tier of difficulty. Mm-hmm. You know, standard ten to nineteen ten to nineteen. Five to fourteen on easy, five to twenty-four on hard, and so and so on. That is ve- that is very reminiscent of the uh, of the act of that act table. Um. Mm-hmm. Well, my the way I look at it is, you know, you you have uh, target numbers mm-hmm. in a D twenty game. And it's like, what does a DC ten mean in uh, Dungeons and Dragons? You know, it, you know, for for some characters that's going to be very easy. For some characters that's going to be very difficult. But it's it's like, and you know, the 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 scale isn't the same. You know, depending on what whatever task it is you're doing. So I really just say, you know, is something standard, which most roles should be, do I think, man, that should be really hard? Or should do I think, yeah, that's probably pretty easy. Um, and you just have to remember three numbers, basically. And you can either say, you know, that's so hard I think it would be impossible, or that's so easy, why are we even rolling? So I've got those those two additional tiers of difficulty. Mm-hmm. And just for the sake of reference, I'm gonna I'm going to share with you the universal table for Marvel Phase Rip, which used a roll under D100 approach. Okay. Um. Oh. So you have the you the columns is is basic is basically determines the threshold for the de- for the degrees of success. Which is where you mm-hmm. have the whole white, green, yellow, red in this case. Yeah. Oh, this is and, kind of where I'm at, just way more complicated. Yeah, because well, it is very difficult to do a rules light superhero game, mostly because of all of the different powers and and the like that you have to account for. Yeah. I mean. It's one of the reasons I don't actually like superhero games that much. It's it's one of the genres that I haven't played very much of because of of that sort of problem. The ra- the rare exception for me was mo- was stuff like Marvel Heroic, um, mm-hmm. because in- instead of in- because all all that any po- all that any power was was a um, was a die code. That that could be that could be interp that could be interpreted. It's not a, it's not as tactical, obviously. It, in fact, I'd mm-hmm. say tr- I'd say trying to do full on tactical with su- with supers would be very difficult at the best of times. Yeah. And well, I, was... I think that's one of the reasons why games like Masks succeed, where a lot of these other ones fail, because. Uh, it works more like how comics actually work, because you know, who's going to win in a fight between Captain America and Batman? And the answer is whoever's writing the comic book. Um, 
because you know it, it's so amorphous you know i could set up a scenario where superman beats the hulk or or vice versa um but you know it will, that's usually the least interesting aspect of you know what's going on in a superhero story and it's much more you know what the emotional stakes are you know i've te- i've tested about with masks and it did it Masks didn't quite do it for me for one specific reason. It's using fate as a template, and it's going to have sure. the one problem that I repeatedly have with fate. That it, that being, it doesn't do a fate does not do a good job at exploring the exploring where the line is between a good or a bad aspect. Not mm-hmm. in terms of good or bad, in in terms of positives or negatives, but in terms of ones that are would be too specific or too broad. The parallel that I could use is in the core book for 13th age, there is that two page spread regarding the, regarding the um, right and wrong way to do your one unique thing and why, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the one unique things that are, that are good ideas, ones that might be pushing the line and ones that are absolutely not. Right. And there is, when you're giving pl- when you're giving both players and GMs a blank check, which is what aspects or one unique thing or descriptors are going to be, that's that's a line that I think you have to establish. Mm-hmm. Because uh, because otherwise you're otherwise you're going to end up with the insanity that you get from say Wushu, where where everything where everything is up for grabs. Yeah. Played a Wushu one shot one time, and I was like, wait. I, and one of the players was like, literally, you just keep talking until he has held up enough fingers that you, you get the full dice pool. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that is the entirety of the mechanic, huh? Yeah. But, by the way, um, I did I did see some of the bullet points that you put in the... You'll probably like Mythic Space if you've ever... Like, and some... Some of those, some of those made me laugh, like the like the pausing a Halo land party. Oh. Yeah, that's that's a very specific experience that I have had a surprisingly number, large number of people be like, "Wow, that's such a deep cut," but it is laser focused to you know my adolescence. And I was like, oh. "Yeah, yeah, man, you described my entire existence when I was 16." I used. I used a land party so that I ha- so that I had cover for for what was either the best or the worst um, prank to ru- to ruin three pr- to ruin the proms of three high schools in the span of two days. <laughs> okay. Oh. It, it, it sounds like there's a story there. Um, it, mo- it mostly has it mostly has to do with with me with um with me me with me finding specific ways to mess with the prom king and queen as well as well as um. As well as replacing the music for the dance with the sound of vuvuzelas. Oh God! <laughs> like imagine, imagine hearing the sound of a vuvuzela playing on a playing on a PA for minutes at a time. That might oh, be too evil to con- contemplate. Um, I think there was one case where I where I locked all the bathrooms except I locked the doors. I had the doors locked to the bathrooms except for the ones on the highest floor. So you had to go all the way up if you needed to go, and then go all the way back down. Are you uh, sure you're not a super villain? <laughs> um, there has been debate on the matter, especially especially since well, for one of them, I this was shortly after that whole butterfly voting fiasco in Florida. I met I messed with the voting for prom king and queen, so it tied like three or four times, and they had, they had to keep redoing the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> The practical joke is an art, and mm. the best way to do that kind of art is to be willing to do what other people won't. But of course, of course, at the time all that went down, I was at I was at that Halo land, pissing everybody el- everybody else off because I was abusing BXR. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh. I was even I was even worse with Battlefield because I had the tendency to put claymores at the top of ladders. 
I'm I'm gonna go back to my superhero supervillain question. <laughs> And I, I knew when I do I, think I, you might just be evil. Um, I can't say that's the case. I have had people tell. I've had I have had people ask if um, the song "You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch" is was sung about me. Yeah. <laughs> but I also I also um when you say when you say when you had pointed out um hey could could you run Traveler with D and D four E. We're kind of disqualified from from Traveler because you don't die during character creation. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Tra- Funny story. I have actually never played Traveler, but I have heard enough Traveler stories and just absorbed it through osmosis that you know I uh, yeah I, I felt like I could write about it, and it's more you know. No, nobody's ever thought, can I use D&D 4E to run Traveler? But it's just like, it gets that point across, mm-hmm. that it's like, it's this cool space sandbox where you tool around the galaxy in a ship, but then you also get, you know, do the 4E thing, where you bust out, like, a miniature little, like, tactics war game every time you try to get into a fight. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm not disagreeing as far as uh, on the question of Garrus being best, being best option when it comes to Mass Effect. Yes. I mean, so my personal choice is I always pick Liara and then I hook Garrus and Tally up, but I object. So my heart is there, but in my head, I objectively know that Garrus is the best romance because yeah. he's also the best bromance. <laughs> but it is funny that you bring up Lancer because one of the things I've, I've talked about when it comes to Lancer is, is as much as I like it, and then, and this is a pattern I'm beginning to notice with a, with a lot of folk trying to adapt Lancer into anything but its setting is like like pushing a boulder uphill. Yes, Lancer is very cool, but it is very much itself, and it doesn't want to be anything but itself. Because some because somebody I remember I was in a discussion where people were um, recommending mecha RPGs. And somebody brought up Lancer, and I said, I'd put an asterisk on that because if somebody's a fan of, say, Gundam or Macross, fuck you, Harmony Gold. I can't really, I can't really recommend Lancer to them because they're not going to be able to do their a XP of a of a Gundam. In fact, the the game I ended up recommending at probably the- depends on which Gundam series you're talking about. Even the, even even then, it's still a, it's still a it's still a stretch. Um, the one I ended up recommending instead was Battle Century G. I don't know if I know that one. Uh, that one was based. On, that one was a successor to a previous project called Giant Guardian Generation, which was heavily inspired by the Super Robot Wars series of video games. Okay, and. It's got the, it along with along with its companion book Battle Century Z. There's enough there where the, where um where you can have a degree of you can have a degree of tactics and a degree of customization without going full Mechton Zeta, which I love Mechton, but um, Crunch be thy name. Yeah, you can do something. well. <laughs> you know, I I feel like that comes with the territory. With mech games, but maybe that's just because BattleTech poisoned my brain at a young age. Um, I consider Battle Century Z, Battle Century G to be crunch medium. Mechton Zeta is um, is is more on the freeform end of things in terms in terms mm-hmm. of what you can potentially do with it. Because even though its setting is le- is leaning one is leaning one particular way. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to go ridiculous with it to the point of doing combiners or or even transformers with it. Uh, so it has a there's a little bit of the universalist DNA in how in how Mechton Zeta works when it comes to its mech creation, and that comes with its own costs. There's a bit right. there's a bit of that in in G, but not as much. So it's gonna be a bit more approachable. Plus. It's only it's only using D six. Mm. Uh, 
Though it is, it does have a tension system that isn't too far removed from the escalation die, so full circle on that front. Yeah. But one of the other things that I I certainly found interesting was the whole learning through failure thing that you have. Yes. Um, because one of the things is um one of the main mechanics that, you know, if you just read the book, it only takes up like a paragraph, but it's a huge part of the system, which is pushing yourself. Um, and the fact that you get to push yourself and can increase your die rolls at the cost of stress gives you a lot of control over which roles you are going to succeed and fail um sort of at the cost of your character's mental health in a way but i wanted to um have an incentive there to sometimes let it ride and just say no it's okay that my character fucked up because that's going to make things more interesting and um you know it's like that classic example of like han stepping on the stick when he's sneaking up on the stormtrooper so that the battle of endor can happen mm -hmm. um and you know i wanted it to feel like you know it, it's like you're you have this choice over which roles you're going to succeed and nobody's ever going to choose to fail unless you give them a reason to, even if it would make a better story. It's like players will optimize the fun out of a game if you give them the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. So you want to kind of nudge them back into the direction of where the fun is. Which I can, I can certainly get behind that. Oh. Now... When it comes to one particular question that that ends up getting brought getting um brought up whenever you're dealing with games that games that have um advanced tech is how is um is it a ca is it a case where fi where firearms and ranged combat rules rules the day or is or is there a place for getting in close? Um, so. If we're talking realistically, no. Um, well, obviously you know, not realistic, but right. But we're dealing with so. So here, issues. here's the thing. You know, my game is not designed to emulate. You know what combat in a real world situation is like, or what I think combat in 500 years will be like, because you know I don't think dudes 500 years in the past would have any concept of like drones or you know missiles or or we anything are like that we as a species are terrible at predicting um theaters of combat in yes. just the next in just the next five years let alone so, the next so, 500 yes so my game is written to emulate the way that combat works in video games and if we're going back to Halo with the Golden Triangle, then yes, there's absolutely, you know, incentive to get in close and, you know, punch someone in the face. Mm -hmm. oh. there, obviously with obviously with Halo and especially Halo Two, the big the big um reason you'd you'd want to get you'd want to get in close is it's a good it's a good way to real to really mess with people's shields. That's why BXR was so Infamous, yes. Um, and of of course, there's also there's also the whole thing of how how ridiculously powerful the energy sword is. But the fact that you've got to get in, cl you've got to get in close, and if you miss, you're really vulnerable. Yeah. Well, you'll notice all the options in my game that you have to get in close for are all the highest damage options. Mm -hmm. Um. So you've got that sort of a risk reward trade-off there, and 
in the same vein, I I remember I remember when people were complaining about the the pistol in combat evolved being OP. I actually defended the pistol, and the reason I did is because even if anything is going to go down in three shots with that thing, you have to lead your shots. Sure. I think... Uh, well, you know, the the, the thing that the people had the problem with, with the pistol is that it doesn't match the fantasy of the pistol. Because people didn't have a problem with the DMR and Reach. And the DMR and Reach is basically just the Halo 1 pistol. Just they turn it into a rifle instead. Okay. So it, it's more, it's more the, um, it's more the fantasy and the imagery doesn't match up with the mechanics there. It, it's ludo narrative dissidence, you know, which and, is everybody's absolute favorite phrase. And to be fair, when it came to reach, I had bigger problems than the, as far as the as far as the DMR problem, it honestly depends on what map you what map you're in. Some ma some maps it becomes a power weapon. Some maps it becomes powerless. Yeah. But the bigger problem they had was armor abilities. Sure. And just in general, the, um, Bungie's attempts to try and put a fourth pillar into the go into the golden triangle. You et you ended up with one of two one of two options: either A stuff that didn't that didn't really impact as much and I wouldn't miss if it wasn't there like say equipment in 3 or you have mm. or you have stuff that it that is getting in the way of other mechanics like armor abilities right they didn't really get adding a fourth pillar right until destiny and even then it took them a long ass time to get there to get all the supers balanced and even then uh, maybe they're not. Who knows? Nah, not re not really. But what would, now when it comes to the full when it comes to the full page count of uh, Mythic Space, what are you shooting for? Uh, it's pretty close to two hundred right now. Um, which I feel is you know uh, it's a pretty good length. You know you've got enough there for. Um, you know, you've got all your character building options and rules, and then, uh, you've got the GM chapter, and then you've got the, uh, antagonists, which take up, um, you know, a quarter of the book by themselves. Like, a quarter of the book's just like a monster manual. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, I think if you're going to have a combat game, you need to have cool stuff to fight. And in many ways, you know, like settings are defined by their villains. Yeah. You know, that's where the conflict is. And s speaking of that, one of the interesting things that Fourth Edition had that ha that only a couple of games I can think of have dipped into was the the idea of NPC roles. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm curious if you have if you are considering dipping into that co into that concept. For bit for building encounters. Uh, yeah. I mean, if if you look at the bestiary chapter, um, or the antagonist chapter, there is a role assigned in the description of each um uh, of each uh, stat block. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, you you've got you can certainly uh sit there and pick out you know like two troopers and a support character and like an artillery character and you would have a pretty good encounter or you can rely on the uh, random encounter tables which I also have so or you can do a bit of both you can drop a random encounter and then maybe swap one unit out to create a more balanced encounter mm -hmm. and those roles sitting there give you the tools to do that yeah, because you you probably remember in the monster manual for fourth edition how each each of the instead of get instead of doing a individual monster entry for each one, they ha they had it as okay. This is a type of monster. Here's sub here's 
stat blocks of subtypes, and here's a sample way in how you can how you can build a uh, monster party. And right. I distinctly remember one of the in one ca in one case my first run with fourth edition. I had the party up against um, kobolds, which in normal situation you think, oh, oh, that, oh, that's cute. They'll go, they'll go down easy. Kobolds and Fury will mess you up, man. They w party wiped. <laughs> I believe it. Full on TPK because they, their whole might, they were still in Those dragon shields, right? Those dragon shields are nasty. It was the combination of both the dragon shields and me really abusing shifting. Yep, shifty is an OP ability. Oh. Uh. And they they hated the shifting until they started using it themselves. Mm -hmm. Because nothing's gonna really piss off a melee guy than be, than be, than being it than being unable to get into melee. Right. So next time around, instead instead the mm -hmm. the fighter instead of going with um, sword and board, he went with sword and poke. Ah. <laughs> Which honestly is an underrated strategy in a in a lot of fantasy games. Well, well, so, not sword and poke. The gum, spear is is board. the dominant military weapon throughout most of history, and it has been woefully underserved by basically every RPG that's ever come out. I think there's there's a few exceptions, but when it comes to the big, when it comes to the names that we're supposed to be following, yeah, they, yeah, they have that problem, which is also the reason why that whole claim of. Oh, you can use this to run any kind of fantasy. Always ring hollow to me because my counter was okay. If the if the def if the default way to equip a martial character is sword and board, how are you going to do the board part in cultures that don't really treat shields as a thing, like say Japan? Right. But basically, every culture has developed the pointy stick. Yeah, and that, that's not even getting into a place like India where the the weapon that has the biggest cultural relevance isn't the sword, it's the bow. Yeah. Spears spears are at a second place when it comes to that. But you you look at a lot of those epics and the bow is always the is always the big weapon. Yeah. Uh, now of co of course for of course for me, I always encourage people to think outside the box when it comes to how to equip their character. Um, I had I I had to I had to explain to a GM once what the hell a kopesh was when we were when we were running a Dark Sun themed campaign. And I figured that would be a good idea, a good time to um, throw that weapon in. Hmm. I mean, Dark Sun would be the place to do that. Yeah, and you've you've probably seen what a kopesh looks like, haven't you? Oh yeah, I know what a kopesh looks like. Mm -hmm. But. It's those ki those kind of things. That's why. That's why. A weaponized question mark. <laughs> that's w that's why take that's why taking the taking the standard weapon approach and trying to shoehorn it into everything doesn't qu doesn't always work. Um, mm -hmm. I do appreciate the use of the use of weapon mods because in a lot of in a lot of fantasy and and SF games. Oh. Um, the idea of weapon customization seems to be something that gets scoffed, and I've never understood why. Right. Well, I tried in my earlier drafts to just basically, like, come up with, like, this massive list of all these, like, you know, yeah, projectile weapons and energy weapons, and they all had, like, their own strengths and weaknesses, like, you know, uh... I think projectile weapons were were better against shields, and energy weapons were better against armor. And uh, I, I tried to like come up with all these different traits for this stuff, and I was just like, wouldn't it be more interesting if I just ripped all this out and then let people kind of like build their own from scratch? Mm -hmm. and that's sort of like where the modding system came from. Yeah. Because if because if you think of, if you think about it, there's the idea the idea of the one size fits all fi firearm um, doesn't doesn't ring doesn't ring true as doesn't ring as true as much as people might think. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
how how many different versions of nine millimeter ammo are, are there out there? The answer is way too many. Yeah. And that's not even getting into into some of the weirder stuff or the t the time that one game um said that it said that it was that a particular weapon was using 50 caliber bullets and 50 caliber ammo and I'm like okay which kind of 50 cal because because depending on which one you're using if you're putting that in a handgun I have questions <laughs> yeah you're going to have a bad time you're going to have a bad time regardless but if if you're do if you're doing the 50 cal and say a deagle it's going to be a bad time if you're doing say yeah. 50 beowulf you're going to have an even worse time yeah that's for people who don't want to have wrists anymore. Oh, now, in, in this particular case, it could probably get away with that because because oh because it was going into science fantasy approaches, which mm -hmm. is an easy is an easy way to bullshit your way out of anything. But, oh sure. But it was but some people would would raise up a storm about that kind of thing. For for me, it's a case of I'm going to use this to do to do dumb shit and have fun. <laughs> like I've I've given my players the noisy cricket just to watch just to watch and see what happens. No, yeah. No, you want to have a good time? Just give somebody a sphere of annihilation and uh, watch them go to town with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, but with that, with all that said, I I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how uh, Mythic Space develops. And I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Well, I certainly appreciate the invitation. I've had a good time. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right, then. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!